Go for it. Freaking what up, dude? Um, it's Trotter Wilson. I'm the host of this podcast. That's mine. Going to be called History is Nice. History is nice. Friggin' what up, Dankatorians, dude? Welcome back to another ep of History is Dank, dude. Frickin' your host, Strider Wilson here, dude. We got Aaron on the sticks, dude. What up, Aaron? What up? Frickin' chillin', dude. Absolute beast, dude. Aaron, let me ask you something right now. And I need full honesty because I gave you full honesty. Yeah. Are you wearing pants? No, I'm kidding. Are, <laughs> did you? Yes. <laughs> Yes, we are both wearing pants. <laughs> but no undies. We go commando, dude. Aaron and I just a little... This episode is going to come out probably in the new year, but we are recording this right before the holiday season, and we did our we treated ourselves to a nice little holiday meal. This time, In-N-Out Burger, dude. I got Aaron In-N-Out Burger, dude. What'd you eat, Aaron? And what did you think of it? I had a 4x4. Four four. That's four pat. That's four, four patties, patties, four cheeses between two buns. Between two buns, lettuce. Although I didn't really feel the lettuce and pickles. Uh, no regrets. It was good. Well, Love that. some regrets. Yeah. yeah. Uh, few amount. Word to the wise: <laughs> If you're gonna do four, four patties ever in your life, and and I I encourage uh, food tourism. I am a food tourist. Yes. Uh, you know. Have a have a have a go at it, make a day of it. You got to try anything twice. Yeah, uh, definitely don't go four cheeses. Yeah. Go four by two, like my car. Yes, yeah. Eat your burgers like your vehicles. Yeah, four by twos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One slice of cheese for every two patties. Although I would argue double double is fine. It's not too much. Yeah, double double is about all you need. Like basically, you need two cheeses. You don't need anything more than that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. If you're getting six patties, if you're a teenager, you know, and your buddies are daring you, and it's after a football game, you're trying to impress a girl or something. I get it. You know, in you my head, I was trying. Six six. In my head, I was trying to make the analogy to when I make scrambled eggs because I like to make scrambled eggs with cheese. Oh, good. Call. And I do one piece Ooh. of cheese for every two eggs. Ooh, that doesn't correlate with burgers quite the same. I think you can stop at two pieces of cheese and go as many burgers as you want from there. But yes. I don't think you need that much cheese. It it really overpowered it. It was still delicious, don't get me wrong, but it was very rich, and uh, I'm hurting a little bit. I feel you. Double-double is all you need, baby. That's yeah. why it's on the menu. Get that double-double, but you had to try it. And being a food tourist is is legit. I mean, it sounds like something, and I, you know, I'm somewhat accusatory, and maybe this is a big bias of mine, that an adult virgin would say, Aaron, and this is no knock on you. You know, someone who would use a metal detector. It sounds like someone who's like, you know, would go instead of spending the holiday with their family they'd go i'm just gonna go get sushi by myself at a place i've always been trying to try on christmas you know um but that's it's not like that it's actually legit like when you go travel somewhere you get the food yeah that's life that's like literally i go to italy i'm gonna look at some ancient ruins i'm gonna get some food and then get a nice prostitute you know what i mean and really enjoy myself and and tell the family hey i'll be back in 30 minutes just watch the kids (laughs) Where are you going? I mean, oh, I, also, I forgot something in Pompeii. You can you can be a food tourist in, in the town you live in. Like, I'll go to Eagle Rock yeah, and try what's what's cool and what's known over there. You know, I've been to the Oinkster. I know what it's like. See, I love that. And Aaron, you know, you know me doing valet, I, gotta, I like to try stuff around town. It, I can recommend stuff. And I like to treat myself. Okay, I'm sorry. If I'm not taking care of me, then who is? And one of the things I like to do, it's built into my budget, dude. You know, I tell all the young valets, I'm like, dude, open a Roth IRA. Dude. You know, how much are you investing in vaping, dude? Invest some of that in an IRA. You know, and you're going to be thanking me 10 years from now. You are going to be thanking me because you're going to have money to pay for those medical bills from vaping. And I'll tell you, you got to try, I build it into my budget of trying nice foods. You know, I'll spring a little bit more for the gourmet burger or a dank ass chicken parm at a restaurant. I like to go out to a nice meal. My fiance, who's dank as hell, you know what I mean? We're dank. We're dialed in. We've got each other's buttons figured out. We know how to press them. We know how to enjoy and explore each other. And I'll tell you, she knows that I... Like to try food, and she's like Strider. Like you know, like we, you know, we're talking obviously about our futures, down payment on a house. And I go, she's like, hey, I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna cut this out, save a little bit of money here. Maybe I'll buy one less 
you know, piece of decor or like, you know, not get a massage when she likes to get it, even though she earns them because she works hard and she's an absolute beast. And I'll go, no, I will not cut back on enjoying my dank ass eats because that's what I like. I would rather enjoy dank ass meals on a regular basis and then like save up and go on a ski trip. Sure. I'll tell you right now, I could never go skiing again and be okay. I've never been skiing, so I'm okay. You're not missing much. I I don't need a blown ACL. I really don't. It's, yeah, it's, it's doing anything that I did as a kid in my adult body. Like me trying to get on a pair of rollerblades right now very sounds very terrifying. Very terrifying. If I've done it in the past, I think I could still do it. So I think rollerblades, I'm fine. Like but muscle memories there. But dude, yeah, here's the thing. Skiing, can't, can't learn that new trick. That's so also true. Do it. And the investment that you're making to go do it. It's like 600 yeah. bucks. If you buy a lift ticket, you got kids, family waiting in line, all this deal, dude. You got to walk in your boots and shit. Like you go to the cafeteria in your ski boots, dude. <laughs> Don't get some soup, bro. Cause you're going to spill that all over the place. You're going to be hucking that thing left and right doing the cafeteria, bro. But it's also sick because you get yourself a nice Bloody Mary, dude, and a little Sky vodka, dude. The good thing about skiing is you can wear tight clothes, dude, and they can still keep you warm, and I like that. Or the opposite. You can go complete big, baggy, you can. warm stuff. But I like a sleek, oh, sexy ski look. I like a I Nordic. Yeah. I like to have, if I, I do have a small penis and balls, so I don't have a bulge, but I'd like something. Maybe I'll put like an extra mitten in there. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm skiing, I'll, I'll stuff my, my penis and balls into an actual mitten that I wore when I was a younger kid because, you know, I don't throw out ski gear. So I actually have a, a <laughs> young mitten that I put my my manhood, really my boyhood into and it keeps it a little extra warm as I go down the mountain. And it looks also like I have a bolt. So people in the cafeteria look at me and they go, oh, that's sick. This guy must do double blacks. But really, I'm just doing blue squares and cruising on a nice, healthy Bloody Mary buzz. So just a little word of the wise there. I mean, just, you know, kind of Treat yourself. That's all we're saying, dude. Aaron and, and I are treating ourselves. And again, it can be local, and it doesn't even have to be expensive. Exactly. You don't need to go to a Morton State. You're not getting Ruth Chris every day. No, you're just getting a, a gourmet sando. If I'm you're trying, you know what it is? You're supporting small businesses a lot of the time. Speaking about like where, in and out. you know, where whereabouts you valet, I got to go to Wahlburgers at some point. Yeah, it's close. It's on the Sunset Strip right, right? there, and I haven't been yet. Me neither. I want to try it. Got to go at some point. Got to check that box. Got to have an informed opinion, dude. Mm -hmm. It's experience, baby, and failure is part of it. Sometimes I fail, sometimes I succeed, and it gets put on the rotation, it gets put on the radar, and daddy goes back. And then they know me there, and then they know me, and they go, Strider, what up, dude? What are you getting today? And I go, don't worry about it, dude. Let's just cruise. Um, so today, for a historical share, we are going to be talking about doing another dank-ass episode. We're going to be doing a historical accuracy of a legit-ass movie that I love, the Last Samurai. Dank movie. But Aaron, is there some controversy here? I think I've heard through the grapevine that you don't think this movie is dank. Uh, I mean, you... Stupid Microsoft. Yeah, that's what happened, dude. Microsoft just freaking listened, uh, dude. They, Microsoft just downloaded the fact that Last Samurai is dank right there. It's like, blah, blah, blah. No, it, it threw up some security. It was worried about me getting in a rage. <laughs> um, no, I'm not in a rage. <laughs> you know, you fa you know, dank Torians know I love me some Tom Cruise. Yeah. My favorite. Yeah. My favorite actor in the world. Good pecs. Runs good. Great pecs. Runs good. It's not easy got, to run really good like he does. Got great flow in this movie. Amazing great flow. flow. Pulls off a man hair. bun. Pulls off a man bun where you look at him and you go, is this guy a wedding photographer? And then he wields a samurai sword and you go, no, he's yeah. a samurai. It's got everything I would want in it, I think. Samurais, Tom Cruise, Old West guns as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's like literally the best. So... You got to, I mean, don't you love it? It just gets a little slow about yeah. middle of act but, three. But you know, spoiler alert, when Ken Watanabe says, I shall miss our conversations. I mean, I love those conversations. I mean, and Aaron, you're a podcaster. Don't you love conversations? I love spontaneous conversations that we have here. Not right. scripted. Not scripted. Um, somewhat. Um, you know, ephemeral is not what I'm looking for. Perhaps if I would be, I don't want to say pretentious because I really enjoy them. But but flirting with that, right? Yeah, yeah. Thematical, two guys only speaking in metaphors together, you know? You're like, yeah, all right. Yeah. Dude. Um, I get that. But, dude, they're two alpha bros who are warriors from different parts of the world who, you know, maybe don't see eye to eye, and they maybe save each other in an interesting way, mm -hmm. even though 
save each other's souls, but maybe not lives yeah. and hearts. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, so basically today, and we got to thank my freaking dog, J.D. Lipinski, dude, who's an absolute beast, dude. Um, for doing the research on this episode. He absolutely crushed it, dude. And I was actually going to do some research of my own on this episode by rewatching Last Samurai, which I've probably housed this movie about 10, 15 times in my life. So it sits in the dome. But I like to do a refresher before doing the ep. But last night, I just got really sucked into the... I think this movie called Ice Road with Liam Neeson, dude. How am I not going to watch him <laughs> dr- drive a truck across, you know, from North Dakota up to Winnipeg, dude? How are you not? How am I not going to watch... William Neeson get on an 18 wheeler and pull up heavy mining equipment to save some bros dude are just trying to do their job Liam Neeson plus snow equals gold let's go exactly dude that's how you create like that's alchemy you just figured out alchemy right there Aaron yep. they've been trying to do it for years to take Liam Neeson you take snow and you got gold dude you put you give Liam Neeson a, a, a masculine task to accomplish like getting his daughter back or saving a group of workers dude yeah bro I'm watching that. I'm I'm clocking in and watching that movie. I feel like they should. I feel like to get that movie, you should clock in to watch it. You know what I mean? <laughs> punch in, dude. Check out that movie for two and a half hours and punch out. Be a nice little interactive experience. Because that's what it is, dude. You know. Should show that's the movie that should be on in every break room in America. Every break room, every job I've ever worked. I'm like, who watches? Who like really watches the show? Um. What's that fucking that fucking nerd show that was on forever that was so successful with Sheldon? Oh, Bing Bang Theory. Who watches that? I mean, everyone. Everyone, apparently. It's millions of views. And you know who everyone is? Everyone in a break room at work. That's the show that's always on. Yeah, now. Yeah. Always. Back, back when I was working in security, uh, the break room was always one of two things, mm. which was awesome mm. because it, it satirized our plight mm. as security guards at this place uh office space oh that's nice and reno 911 okay that's a great work one of those two was always on that sounds like your work friends could actually become your real friends yeah. you know your work friends aren't always your real friends yeah you know what i mean but you you're it's like your boy you're like all right we're gonna get through this eight hour shift together we're gonna be boys while we're here you know yeah and that's like you could be boys while you're not there and that's sick as hell yeah I respect that. I mean, dudes are watching the post and up watching the office. We're on one. You know what I'd like to put on in the break room if when I become, you know, I'm, I haven't mentioned this. Maybe I haven't mentioned this on the pod. I got a little promotion at work, dude. Um, stepped up from valet and now I'm on the door, which is sick, dude. Um, and I'm basically assistant managing, which is sick. And um, and I, I would recommend anyone be an assistant anything. Like, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. But think about if, like, you could be an assistant astronaut, how sick that'd be, Aaron. I still get a fucking sick ass leather jacket with like a patch. Yeah. You know, if I was single, I'd probably get tons of, excuse me, Bunnies, dude. Yeah. Little space, little moon bunnies hopping around, dude. Hopping on my little tiny dink, dude. You know what I'm saying? Take a little bit of moon rocks back from, you know, from when I gathered them up there. Put them on the floor and be like, yo, you want a bone on the moon? You want to go to the moon? Let's go, dude. You know what I mean? And I'm a power bottom. Actually, in in this fantasy, I'm a power bottom. In real life, I'm a finesse bottom and a quick finisher. So, I mean, I think that'd be sick. but, But anyways, what I'm saying is, it's sick, and so in managerial position at work, if it was my call to put on the break room TV, like, to control it, you know, because at work, like, they don't give you the remote because it'd be arguments. Some schmoll would come in and be like, I want to watch the Bruins. Like, I'm from Boston. I need to... The Bruins are in, like, round two of the playoffs. It's like, dude, sorry, bro. We're all watching fucking Reno 911. I would put on... Um, <clears throat> I'd put on, like, anime, dude. Like, I want to put on some good, you know, metaphorical anime, which I've been getting into. I've watched Spirited Away... And there's even some sexual anime that I'd like to watch. Not getting so far as to get into hentai, but, you know, a nice, I would say, almost not safe for work anime where maybe there aren't sex scenes, but, you know, it's people in nature and they're they're exploring heavy metaphor. Heavy sexual animated natural metaphor is what I want on my break room TV. And I think that put everyone in the best space for you know, making gains and providing good customer service. I have a theory that if you have half wood, you're going to be giving better customer service. You're going to be a little bit horny. It's going to give you a little sense of urgency, you know? I think horniness provides a slight sense of urgency. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. If you're not horny, you're just kind of like, all right, like, think about it. After you boned, you're not horny anymore. And you're just like, all right, chill, cool. Like if I'm at Valet, what? Oh, you're just coming in for lunch? Okay, cool. Hey, 
don't forget to get this validated. Like, that's fine. I mean, I guess you can get it validated. I really, <clears throat> honestly, now that I think about it, dude, just park for free. Just park for free. And don't get me wrong, that's fucking chill. That's a chill ass worker, but it's not good for business. Yeah. That worker's a little bit horny. They're going to be like, hey, what's going on? Welcome. How are you today? Oh, fantastic. Oh, you're coming in for lunch? Great. Go ahead and get this validated. You're gonna, it's going to make you happy when you get that validated. Yeah. Let's get it. You want to get it validated together? I'll show you where to get it validated. No, it's cool. Let's do this together. Great. Yeah, no, it's 15 instead of 20. Yeah, you, gratuity is optional. Oh, you want to tip me too? Then they just got themselves a tip. And the bit, company made money. Why? Horniness. Yeah. All right. And the movie that I'm horny for and that I'm really horny to get into right now is The Last Samurai. So we're going to tackle this by giving you guys a little refresher. And number one, what I would say is just watch this movie, dude. Spoiler alert a little bit today, but you know... I'm not going to get into the heavy, heavy details, but I'm just going to give you sort of a what happens here. Um, I won't tell you what happens in the end or anything like that, but um, I will go through some historical accuracy afterwards. But first, let's just talk about, in a healthy way, what goes on in the movie and who we're talking about here. So you've got Tom Cruise who's walk, rocking a healthy man bun that looks like he could be like a center midfielder for an Italian soccer team, you know? And he's suffering from alcoholism, PTSD, which a lot of soldiers did after the Civil War, of course. And at this time, I think they called it like battle fatigue. It like went from like battle fatigue to shell shock to PTSD. And it's all this, you know, same stuff. Basically, you're tr fucking traumatized from what you witnessed, the atrocities that you witnessed. And he also fought in the, they call it, it's called the Indian Wars, um, which is, of course, America, um, going through and taking Native Americans lands. That's really all it was. You know, they would sign. And we talked about this on the last podcast a little bit, Legendary Gunslingers Ep, um, a few episodes ago, episodes ago um, just about how, you know, the government would sign a deal with like the Sioux Nation, giving them like the Dakota Territory. Then they find gold and they're really like, no, we're going to take that back. So they basically was like, here's 50 million acres. But then it's like, nope, you're only actually going to get 10 million acres. And it's in this like really in inhibitable um area that's tough to farm and doesn't have that much buffalo but you can't go outside and if you do then you're like so basically getting a raw deal um so he's traumatized um tom cruise's character nathan algren is his character right and this is takes place in the summer of 1876 right so he's cruising around it he's posted up in san fran dude. he's seeing a show dude he's talking he's sharing his experiences in some sort of like western buffalo bill-esque type show dude and he's just housing whiskey, dude. Just housing it, dude. Also, quick note, dude. The amount of, like, drinking that they do in movies, I'm like, every character's dead. Like, the amount of whiskey, like, they just, like, put back a bottle of whiskey, dude. I'm like, is that even possible for someone to do? Like, wouldn't you just die, Aaron? It's always, like, well, at least on TV, like, Mad Men, it was always, like, isn't it fucking, like, 10 a.m.? Yeah, bro, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, dude, how are you getting through your day, aren't you? Does everyone just nap? Like, during commercial breaks, do these characters nap? What's going on? Um, so he then gets approached by his freaking colonel, dude, who he hates. To this guy, Tony Goldwyn, is Colonel Bagley, dude. And he's like, hey, I got an assignment for you if you want this. And he basically goes to Japan, and they're doing something there called the Meiji Restoration Government, and they're modernizing. Japan is modernizing. Um, you know, when you had, like, I think it was Captain Cook that sailed into the Japanese harbor, and it was a great like awakening for the Japanese government who was like basically or and the Japanese island and culture. They were like living in, in sort of a you would say like at the time, like a third world feudal um, uh, style of, of living. And so they're not keeping up with the modern world, which is, you know, freaking run, run on, on oil. They're still running on, you know, wooden fire. Right. So. They're basically going to modernize, and part of that is to modernize your defenses. And, um, of course, within their own country, there is unrest, and there's always a fight back to progress, right? And there's good things with progress and bad things with progress, and that's a heavy theme in this um, film. Um, and part of what they kill is the beauty of the samurai um, way of life and culture. And we'll get into a little bit of the Bushido Code and everything, Um in a little bit, which is really cool. And, and I think answers a lot of writing questions that we get on this podcast and going deep. I'm like, dude, just go samurai style, dude, have meaning and purpose is, is huge. So in any case, dude, Algren cruises to Japan and he's there to train up the, um, new soldiers. And they're sort of taking, they're using like sort of a rural, um, 
pattern, which like, you know, is that later emulated by Chiang Kai-shek and uh, Mao in China and stuff. But it's like, we're going to take these peasants and farmers and we're going to, you know, give them jobs and the government will, it takes an own, will take and own their land. And, but then for, to give them jobs, oh, you'll just come and be a soldier now, but they need to get trained. Right. And some of the first battles they have to fight are right on the home front against those who are still wanting to, you know, live the lives that they've always known, you know, change is difficult and that's the samurais, right? And the samurais and, and, and the, um, lords that they, they work for and are employed by. And some of them are like rogue at this point. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but he's over there, he's training dude. And, um, basically what happens is like, he's, um, Tom Cruise has a badass scene dude, where he's like, like they want to get, there's going to be a battle in, in the, freaking uh mr amoro uh played by masato harada um he's like he's like the businessman he's all like embodies modernization he's like look we need to go fight the um samurai now like they're like we have more numbers and and we have superior technology like it'll be fine like they they're these soldiers will know what they're doing and tom cruise is all like no they don't they don't know and he's like shoot me to like just like one of the random soldiers and the soldier's like huh like i'm not gonna I'm, i'll kill you i'm not gonna kill you and tom cruise like gets even closer he's like bro fucking dude shoot me bro and then all, everyone's watching this and they're like this guy's a psycho but tom cruise remember he's a psycho he's alcoholic he's got ptsd he's like you can shoot me and he kind of like kind of probably does want to die but he also knows in the back of his mind the soldier's not ready soldier pulls the trigger completely misses then tom cruise just fucking shoot me and then just goes stares him down just you see you think your soldiers are ready to go up against centuries of training and code? I don't care how how many guns you give me. It's the man holding the gun. If he's not ready to do it, he's as good as death. And he just says all that with his fucking eyes and his fucking man bun, dude. And it's so chill. I'm not going to lie, Aaron. After I saw this movie, I wanted to try to have a man bun. But I have very curly. Basically. I don't think it's going to work for you. Yeah, no. Basically, I have... 70s style pubic hair on my head like from the 70s that's what i have on my head you know what i mean like a like i imagine what my dad was rocking down like his road to the dode in the 70s is what's on my head so it's not equipped for man bun you gotta have straight hair david beckham style hair and cool arm tattoos um doesn't matter though the future is a coming in the they freaking you know, the Japanese, like the, the emperor character is kind of like this soft spoken character. He has, obviously has all the power and everything, but he's like, knows modernization's coming. And basically, the businessman, um, what's the dude's name again? Uh, Mr. Omura is like the one making the calls. And he's like, no. Nah. He's like, I'm speaking for the emperor. Like, we're going to battle. We're going to take out these samurais. We're going to win. And um, they go to battle, and it's kind of like not in an open field. It's not being fought on their terms. Um, sort of gorilla and they go in there and just get completely murked dude and tom cruise is watching this happen he even like is kind of brave and tries to go in there and gets the soldiers to fall back does some good stuff maybe save some lives in doing so but i mean these guys just aren't ready and it's sort of tragic and then everyone ends up retreating and then tom cruise is kind of stuck and he's out there and like basically fisticuffs combat right now like a bayonet picks up a sword takes down a dude i think he does kill a samurai and then but he's then surrounded by a few other samurais and he's as good as dead and he picks up a flag a samurai flag and starts waving it around it has a white tiger on it and this is fucking when ken watanabe's character comes up um uh frick i can't believe i'm this is why i um should have watched this and i'll get his character's name in a second but he comes up on a horse and he sees tom cruise and it kind of goes to this like slow motion thing of him just like waving the flag and then the white tiger and the symbolism and and tom cruise is about to get murdered dude and then he gives the order for the soldier his his um soldiers to not murder him and he's like just knock his ass out let's take him captor dude and then they take tom cruise to their secluded um beautiful homestead and um this is really where the movie begins you know act two really begins here um so it's gnarly dude um they go to their isolated village um oh so let me get his character katsumoto okay katsumoto is a freaking absolute beast um and i better be right it better be ken watanabe that's who i'm going off my dome on that aaron who plays him am i right 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's this, this is where we. This is where we uh, uh, get discover Ken Watanabe. Yeah. Okay, good. And his character's name Katsumoto. He's the head of the samurai. And Tom Cruise kills a character named, I believe, um, Hiro Taro. And then he ends up even living with his wife, which is like this interesting custom. And like you know, obviously, she loved her husband, and this guy who killed her husband is now living in the home. So it's really tough, but with the samurai code and the way of life that we'll get into, like he's a guest now, right? And, and Ken Watanabe Katsunoto believes that this man's life has purpose. And being in this secluded village, he's, he overcomes his alcoholism. He has his shakes. He has nightmares. His traumatic past is coming up. And so it's really, he's working through a lot right now. Um, he ends up like studying um, swordsmanship and, um, and, you know, he's a good warrior, but he learns the, 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 the way to wield the samurai blade, which is a little bit different from the, you know, Western saber or whatever they're using, the more straightforward um, sword and um, definitely a different style. And they're using wooden sticks and Tom Cruise is getting his ass beat, dude. And, um, you know, he's learning the culture and he's getting, he's vi definitely vibing it up um, a little bit. Um, um, Taka is, uh, I believe, Hiro Taro's um, wife's name and, and the woman who is um, taking care of Tom Cruise, Algren. So uh, Taka and um, Algren are definitely having some freaking vibes. And I mean, that man bun's undeniable that he's rocking. So what can you do? Um, then at some point, you know, the Japanese government hires some ninjas. And I'm going to get into some ninjas in a little bit because it's a sick ass fight where you're like, I have samurais fighting ninjas now. And so right now, if you don't have a boner from just like enjoying film and cool shit, this scene really does give you a nice, good, hard boner, harder than the wood swords that they used to train with in the isolated um, samurai village. And it's super sick, and the samurais end up dominating, and it does sort of always answer the question for me, who would win, samurais or ninjas? And I guess, like, ninjas maybe are using the art of surprise a little bit more and, you know, sort of being clandestine and assassinative, um, whereas samurais could probably do that, but I would say in a head-to-head -head combat, like, you know, Mortal Kombat style, I would take samurai over ninja what about you Aaron I mean I feel like the samurai is more disciplined yeah got more armor and ninjas not generally armed yep I mean it's just it's apples and oranges really yeah it's tough it's tough to say it's like you know probably comes down to what that person you know what that samurai or ninja is actually fighting for you know yeah yeah um so Samurais defeat these ninjas, dude. They're like, what, bro? You're trying to assassinate Katsumoto? That's so whack, bro. You can't do that. Um, Tom Cruise learns more about what's actually going on in modernization. He learns more about Katsumoto's point of view. Um, and basically, he's like, he watches like just gnarly stuff happen, dude. He watches how committed these guys are. He's realizing they have purpose when really in his life he had no purpose. He was a soldier without a cause, and he's finally taking up something and, 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 you know, fighting for the man beside him. Um, basically, um, Katsumoto loses his son, dude. Other atrocities happen. Tom Cruise and Taka are hitting it off, dude. Algren and Taka. Then they learn that there's like 2,000 Imperial Army soldiers commanded by Omura and Bagley, right? So it's the past coming to meet Tom. It's, it's his past that he's battling as well at the same time. Everything that he used to stand for and not even stand for but what caused him pain and hurt and who he was a, a hired gun for is coming to clash with what he now has learned to love so it's this beautiful thing for his character and really for the in essence of the times and um it's it's past meets you know present you know but good past and bad past and then good future and bad future it's, it's good it's layered bro it's fucking dank ass onion of a dank ass movie dude um so basically it turns out to be like a Thermopylae type situation with like a small force of 300 dudes or it's only 500 samurai versus 2000 imperial soldiers with guns and you'll learn artillery and another secret weapon that you're going to learn about if you watch it. I won't maybe say that, but it's a spoiler, a little bit of a spoiler, but it's just gnarly. They're outmatched technologically. Um, so basically it's super gnarly, dude. Um, Algren but it knows of their tactics and he suggests using a similar tactic, um, like a different, like a Thermopylae style tactic to really funnel their soldiers in, um, and, you know, create something where they can get close and fight each other and like use the land and everything situationally, maybe for sort of um, limit the effectiveness of their artillery. Um, 
So he, Algren's knowledge really helps Katsumoto here. They team up together. Um, Katsumoto presents Algren with the katana, which is a super high honor. Um, and and Taka gives Algren um, Hirotaro's armor, which is an unbelievable honor and a very personal thing for her, her husband's armor. Um, they smooch, but it's like an honorable, very nice smooch where they're like, we can't, but we want to. We both know we can, but we respect and honor this um, fallen soldier so much that we cannot honor our horniness, which I think is an important thing with horniness as well as practicing restraint. And I think that's nice um, when you're, you know, having that horniness, but also being able to tame the bull that is that horniness is very important. And Taka and Algren do a good job of that in this film. I think that's a beautiful thing. If I was going to write an essay, that's something that I would focus on. That's really what I would zero in on if it was up to me, not, you know, modernization. More, more so horniization and, and harnessing the power behind it. Um, I feel like Tom Cruise is like that in real life. Dude, I agree. I don't even know if he gets horny in real life. I was talking about this with Chad. It's like Tom Cruise, like imagine the rock boning and Tom Cruise boning. I'm like, no, nah, it's like weird. They're like both good looking dudes, you know, muscular in their own different ways, charming and charismatic in their own ways. But I'm like, but then I'm like trying to imagine them bringing the heat down on someone they love. And it's like, I don't know. They're horny for work. Yeah. Yeah. For the craft. Yeah. Which I like and respect. Yeah. And they're effective at it. Maybe they just jack off well. Maybe they're just like, dude, I'm, I'm, they're all about efficiency, I think. They're like, look, if I wake up, have some egg whites, jack off, drink a green drink, that's going to make me the most productive today. I do not, I don't need that intimacy with another human. Maybe they're like that. That's fine. Whatever floats your boat, you know? Yeah. Not as long as you're not hurting your hand and, and, or your dong, you're cool. Anyway, dude, freaking final battle happens. I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but it's gnarly, dude. Um, I mean, you know, it's a historical film, so spoiler alert, Japan has airplanes and cars now, so you probably know what happens, but um, it's just gnarly, dude. Um, it's a sick-ass last battle. A um, lot of good scenes, a lot of heroic scenes. Um, very, very beautiful stuff. Um Maybe I'll tell you, um, ah, should I even say this, Aaron? I mean, I can eat, this movie sold. I can give a little bit of a spoiler, but Go you should it. watch it. It's like, then you got a voiceover at the end where Simon Graham reveals that Algrim was never heard from again after this battle. Um, but in VO, they surmise that Algrim likely returned to the samurai village um, to see Taka. Um, and they conclude philosophically that Algrim found some small measure of peace that we all seek and few of us ever find. There's a lot of war to find that peace. A lot of war. Um, there is a beautiful scene, and I can say this, and I won't give you the details of it, but obviously the Imperial soldiers win, but it's a hard-fought battle, and there's a beautiful moment when these you know thousands of Imperial soldiers are looking out upon the hundreds of samurai that were just sacrificed and all the imperial soldiers like kneel and bow and like great honor and so they still do honor their past in this moment and it's like sort of realizing you know growth hurts and this is part of this progress and there's tragedy behind it but um i would say in george um i was gonna say george carlin not george carlin dan carlin has a great quote where he's like if you take like he's like just talking about Japanese culture and it's always tough to talk about someone else's culture as if you understand. I mean, I'm a freaking white dude from OC. Like if, the, if your culture is like ordering at the cheesecake factory, I fucking got you, dude. You know what I mean? Like if you need the culture of like how to put, you know, curb cream on a fucking, you know, rain gutter and fucking board slide that I got you, bro. Don't worry about that. You want to wear soap shoes, dude. You want the culture behind that? Dude, I'm your freaking dude. Come to Japan I got to branch out. I got to read. I got to ingest shit. And, but Dan Carlin said a great thing where he's like, the Japanese and there's bravery in every culture. There's loyalty in every culture. There's love. You know, it doesn't matter from whatever era, all these themes, honor, you know, all these themes show up. Human, humans recognize these. Music, dance, it may sound a little bit different, but it's all playing into sort of the same emotion and everything, right? People were universal in that measure. 
And so he's saying, you know, with Japanese culture, it's basically everything that we have and know, honor, love, bravery, courage, loyalty, all that good shit, um, but just more intense. He's like, it's just more, it just seems the Japanese do everything, eh, maybe a 10% more intense, maybe maybe 50% more intense. And he proves that, and this is like his introduction to an episode where like, there's a holdout like World War II Japanese soldier in like the Philippines in like the 70s, like 1970s, the war of course ended in 45. Just like kind of using that as a concrete detail of like the intensity of, of everything that's going on. Um, so I believe that. And I think that this moment, it just is a uh, intense display and beautiful display of loyalty there. So now we get into the fucking historical accuracy of the film. I love the movie. Like everything, artistic liberties are taken. I can forgive these things. I like to be entertained. Aaron, on the other hand, when it comes to a little movie called Moneyball, can't get over the fact that they don't mention pitching, which of course won them so many games. Aaron, care to comment? <laughs> I mean, it's not important in every movie, but in a movie that's in my wheelhouse, I mean, you gotta you gotta be able to throw that pitch past me, and they can. Oh, beautifully put. The way you just said that right there was very, very beautifully put, Aaron. Thank you very much. But I still gotta say, I love enjoying Moneyball, except for the daughter's too talented. Um, here we go. Dude. He should just have a regular daughter, dude, who's just into fucking, who's gothic, dude. He should he should have a daughter that's just gothic. Every daughter's gothic, dude. Does every girl at some stage in their life want to be a witch? Like every dude at some stage in his life wants to be like I'm a Marine. It seems that way, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. All right, historical accuracy. Um, according to Jacob here, who's an absolute fucking beast, overall pretty historically accurate, he says. Um, uh, however, for realism, he says it blends a lot of aspects of the story um, that are unrealistic to and, and kind of merges eras a little bit here is basically what I'm hearing. Um, let's see. It blends basically an overall decade of everything into like Tom Cruise's lifespan, which like everything that you take, like, but you need that in a movie. Like it's just super condensed, like Troy, the movie, like it's like three days, but that's like a 10 year battle, right? This is a 10, this is a decade. Um, and uh, the character that Algren's based on is actually a French dude. And we're going to get into him, not an American. So that's one huge fucking difference right there, right? Um, so although, which just means, yeah, I don't fucking, we'll see. Um, I was going to make a stupid joke about French fries and calling them freedom fries. And then in my mind, I said, that's a stupid joke. Don't make it. Yeah. You know? And Tom Cruise's accent work. Not the, not not a strong suit. Yeah. Tom Cruise doing a French accent. Don't need it. Does he play a French dude in the vampire movie? Um, interview yeah. with a vampire. I mean, it's like New Orleans French. Yeah, Creole kind of. Yeah. Also, um, I bet he doesn't do that. I bet he does more of an English accent. Yeah, I think he does. And he just has, he's wearing those big ass fangs. So it's like, he's just doing like fang voice. Um, also, um, ninjas really weren't in use like his assassination. Like, like the, um, like the emperor wouldn't have used ninjas to assassinate Katsumoto. Like he would have sent like a dude with a gun, you know what I mean? Or like trying to get him out in public or something like that. Or like paid someone in his own organization, even though all those dudes are super loyal, wouldn't have worked. Um, quick take, and they do a good job of sort of exploring PTSD and um, not exploring, but um, the characters informed by that. Um, in the 1600s, a Swiss physician, Dr. Johannes Hofer, coined the term nostalgia so he first used the term nostalgia, but it was to describe soldiers who suffer from despair and homesickness. So nostalgic, you know, we use that in a different sense today. It's sort of like a longing remem remembrance of the past, but in the 1600s, it was actually coined as a term for PTSD. Um, in 1761, uh, this dude, Austrian physician, Josef Leopold, wrote a book, uh, uh, on Brugger, wrote a book about um, trauma sick in soldiers, and his idea of nostalgia or PTSD was popularized and noted. So not even until 1761 was PTSD noted. Now, I'm sure in the history, people were like, oh, he's a, he's a veteran, he has issues. Like, they've probably always been addressed, but, you know, in modern record keeping, 1761 is sort of when it arrives. Um, the American Civil War... Um, Many, many military doctors 
um, they called it feeble will is what they would call PTSD. They go, he's suffering from feeble will. That's and so fucked. Yeah. And you know what was used to, to cure it? Public ridicule was sometimes recognized to cure it. So you just ridicule these guys. Fucking be like, oh, yeah, he's feeling all soft because he fought. It's like, uh, okay. No wonder these guys turned to booze. Um, that would not work today. Yeah, dude. No, they would do, vi- and this was like during, you know, this picks up in 1876. You've got opium going around. So morphine and opioids were heavily used by soldiers, ODing a lot on this type of stuff, trying to control their psyche, right? <clears throat> um, let's see. Nathan Algren uses, yeah, I mean, we know his character uses alcohol to escape his past on the frontier and the atrocities of the Indian Wars and, you know, what he witnessed in the Civil War. Um, so it's sort of a beautiful story of him dealing with PTSD up there in the mountains in that second act. Um, yeah, if, you, if you're not familiar, the Civil War was incredibly bloody. <laughs> like, insane. And they call it like a, um, there was like one battle, the siege of... Um, Antietam? No, Antietam was the bloodiest day, had like the most casualties, um, like in a single day. Um, but then there was like Vicksburg, I think might have been just, it was a siege, right? The Confederate, the Union Army sieged it. Yeah. And it was, it was basically a dress rehearsal for World War One. Like they created a no man's land uh, for the very first time where like Confederate soldiers were just in bunkers. There was an air of like area of artillery and just constant shelling and starvation. That was what people were like, oh, this is how m- wars are going to be fought. And observers from Europe would come over and watch the Civil War and being like, oh, okay, we're learning tactics. We're learning how the future is going to look, you know, because you know, technology is always ahead of, even in World War One, like this stuff, the artillery, um, it was basically you needed to get your positioning and, and, and hold your ground, high ground, and just hold it. And it was just battles of attrition. And it just goes to show like how much gas was used in World War One. Where like in World War Two, every army was like, fuck that. There was like, this ruined our soldiers too much and your like they're like, it's not worth using it. They just decided to like completely not use it, which is I always thought was interesting. I'm like, it was so prevalent in World War One, but also strategically like gas sort of dissipates and like World War Two was more mobile with like a blitzkrieg attack by the Germans and then like superior air power and it was probably also a little bit obsolete. It wasn't so much like bunker yeah, yeah. fighting warfare. But in any case, man, fuck gas, dude. Yeah. Um, so basically f- this philosophy of the samurai meeting C- Captain Nathan Algren, um, the, it's, it's basically all about them having a sense of purpose. This clear sense of purpose showed the ability to uncomplicate a life filled by anxiety and doubt, right? So... That all of our lives have that thing, but purpose is what drives the samurai. Um, the film takes a very peculiar note on wanting to perfect everything they do when commenting on samurai culture. Um, they would strive to find a meaning in one's life as the primary motivational force in man. That's Viktor Frankl. He who has a why to live can bear, can bear almost any how. Nietzsche, dude. So not exactly samurai dudes, but that's sort of a Western interpretation of this samurai code. Um, they do not live for an individual desires or to obtain material wealth. Um, samurai live to serve, to serve their country, their culture, their communities, which ultimately benefits themselves. I think it's something we could all learn from, right? Sure. Taking a quick sip of fucking water, dude. All right. We've already explored this idea of rugged individualism taking place in the West and especially on the frontier. Um, The characters that are celebrated out there as individuals, the samurai is the opposite. They are the opposite of, um, they, they, the importance for them is community. Um, Algren is like basically a mercenary, right? Hired by the Japanese government and he's willing to flip sides and, and, um, fight for these samurai just because he's swept up by their beautiful code. Um, Let's see. So the 1870s just has like sort of a hole here. Um, the worth of the individual had been reduced to a measure of their economic value in the West. It's a lot of, it's the reason why a lot of people have moved even farther west because the, where they could feel like individuals. Eastern cultures, however, the importance of the community is greater than the individual, like samurai culture. You'll see 
essential commodities like healthcare, food production, education rarely just left up to the free market. I like that point by um, Jacob here. It's like, we all love the free market. We all talk about that in the United States where we're like, obviously we're not fucking communists, but we're like, um, competition is good. You can't have a monopoly and all this stuff. We talked about this in the Graham Bell episode. Um, but then you talk about stuff like education, healthcare, food, essentials. It's like a prison. It's like, why are we kind of creating a market around those things? It's like very seedy money making stuff. And like, I mean, I guess like the argument is like, well, it's efficiency. Like the free market runs most efficiently. I'm like, yeah, but at the same time, like you can disservice consumers a lot like that. Like the, the consumer of those things can lose out a lot. They don't necessarily win all the time in a free market. Um, it's, especially like healthcare and stuff. So it's interesting. And it's, I like that in the East that it's not left up to that. Um, it's a good, that's a good phrasing. I, I, I think that was a freaking sick ass point. And, um, basically, um, in the 1870s, American society at this time told most vulnerable individuals suffering from mental illness or fighting from the civil war, just to pick themselves up by their bootstraps and go it alone. I mean, that's every rags to riches story. Those are the stories that we love. Right, that's like every American story about class is rags to riches. Then you get these great movies coming out of Korea, right? The Eastern philosophy, like um, you get this great commentary from Squid Game and Netflix, which is current. And then what's the other one that just came out, Aaron? Parasite. Parasite, amazing commentary on class, a very un-American perspective, but a great perspective, but also rings so true to what's happened in America. So it's like it's just undeniable. So I like this Eastern philosophy. Um, so it's just this, it's this new world, this free market, um, and desires of individuals, um, and basically the past, this communal, um, sort of harmonious society. And, you know, they always depict the past glor- glamorously and beautifully. And, you know, there are definitely good things with modern medicine and, and it, you know, it costs and you got to pay people to do those jobs and they want to make things up. So we understand why it happens, but, you know. It's, it's, there could be something better to be strived for. You know, we can always do better. Um, this is pretty great. Captain Nathan Algren's inspiration is this dude, Jules Brunet, who's a French dude. The real man, Jules Brunet, French. He was sent by Napoleon to train soldiers in the use of modern artillery much earlier than the Satsuma Rebellion and before the official Mejai Restoration. So... You know, Algren's story is fabricated based on this guy's journey. Brunet was called back to France, but chose instead to remain to fight in the Beauchene War, a civil war ending with a Meiji victory, um, Meiji victory and restoration of imperial rule. Brunet fought on the losing shogunate side and participated in a glorious and epic last battle, which he survived. The parallels between Algren and Brunet show that Brunet was a definite influence here. So basically you have the exact story, some historical license here, um, but obviously was a French dude. Um, I mean, there just isn't a French equivalent to Tom Cruise. Yeah, no, who are you going to choose? <laughs> Tony Parker from the Spurs? Yeah, or... Uh, Leon uh, the Professional? Ooh, I mean, in his younger days. He's pretty sick. Uh, who's, a, who's a great French actor? The dude from The Artist? There's a dude from The Patriot. Oh, I love that guy. Uh, Checky carry off or something like that yeah I like that out there he's good his younger days sure they're just a little too old no three I agree I agree um you just gotta get an Australian dude to do it just always get an Australian <laughs> dude you know what I mean they're hot they're jacked they get it Australian guys fucking get it dude they're cool um let's see and so that's he's a freaking beast and I mean that's basically there's a few more things here on um, Algren and his, his uh, influence by Jules Brunet. Um, the timelines in the film are generally accurate, having Algren as a soldier who was involved in the Civil War and the wars on the Native Americans. Um, it seems like a stretch, but the dates do line up to make it plausible that Algren is presented as being a part of the, um, the Great Sioux War in 1876, giving less than a year between that and the Japanese Rebellion. Close, but possible. So I like that. So it works. It, the timelines do work for his character and with modernizing and stuff. Little, seems slightly early in the 76. 
you know, maybe you get a little with a little bit more in the 1890s, but maybe they want to incorporate this Magi Rebellion and stuff in the Bichon War that um, Jules Brunet fought in. Um, so it's sick, dude. Um, Freaking sick, dude. So, it, you know, you get these towns of Tom, of, of you get these scenes of Tom Cruise sort of being drunk in Japan, too, where you see like a horse and carriage going by, then like a, you know, uh, a freaking by a train station, right? And it's, he gets splashed by mud, and it's sort of the mucking of technology meets fucking, you know, the past. So it's freaking just basically a dank ass movie, dude. You got to go see it, dude. But the biggest takeaway for me was just knowing that, was learning about the Jules Brunet character. And just learning a little bit about the Bushido code, which I didn't dive into that much, but it's just basically, it's all about selflessness, dude. Yeah. You have your purpose, you're there to serve and by serving. And I think that's sort of, you know what Chad and JT are talking about? It's like, it's all about stoke, dude. You know what I mean? If I'm looking to give others that dank ass stoke, in turn, I will feel that stoke, you know? Yeah. That's a great, very, great philosophy to have. So other than that, dude, I mean, Aaron, do you have anything to comment on the Last Samurai or anything, dude? Anything that you notice that's tight? I mean, I'll rewatch it. Yeah, great rewatch. You know, I'll make sure I'm a little more caffeinated this time. <laughs> it, all right, Aaron is right, dude. There's a point, you know. You're right. It does get a little bit slow there when he's in that secluded village, but that's to show, you know, that's the, the past lifestyle was a little bit slower, a little more beautiful, a little more lived in future boom 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 bingo bingo bongo you know what i mean all right just take a few cues and bone out dude let's do it dear strider i've made some mistakes i'm a sophomore going to college in my hometown possibly my first mistake <laughs> freshman year coming out of a dank high school romance i unknowingly made another mistake hooking up with an alpha female interesting ever since then it's girl code time times 10 the only girls that would look at me are um that will look the only girls that will look at me are other alpha males, not my cup of tea. Alpha females, excuse me, not my cup of tea. I've been told by this by the girls that they are too scared of what she will think to talk to me. The few girls that have looked my way haven't been able to catch feelings for me, f uh, feelings for leaving them feeling like they've been wronged, possibly my fault and third mistake. You see how my reputation has become less than ideal. While I feel I could have played my cards better, I don't think this is deserved. And while I finally found a valid potential GF, she is hesitant to get to know me because of the passage described above. I love my boys here, but I feel like the clock might be ticking. Is it time to pack up and move on? If not, how do I convince this girl that I'm legit about her? Thanks, Strider. Really appreciate the pod, dude. Just going to keep her anonymous, dude. This is emails entitled Mistakes, Alpha Females, Valid GF. So he basically he hooked up with an alpha female. Which, what is an alpha female? I don't know, but she sounds... Like a good soccer player? She sounds like she's in charge at that, okay. at that college. Okay, she makes the move, dude. She's she's the beast. Okay. She's getting after it, dude. Ever since it's then, it's girl code times 10. Only girls that would look at me are other alpha females, not my cup of tea. So, like, all the other girls are like... Okay, so the girls are afraid of yeah. her. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what she'll do, so he, I mean, dude, he just needs to have an honest conversation with this, quote, alpha female and be like, hey, like, I like you, but it didn't work out between us. Like, and also, I mean, the girls need to have a little bit of agency too. Like, maybe he's creating a narrative in their own, in their own minds. That might not even be the actual narrative. Um, maybe there's some accuracy. I don't know. But it's like, these other girls, if a girl is into him, just needs to say, you're not going to let anyone dictate w what your relationship is or who you're going to love. I don't care who al how alpha they are, you know? Like, what do you, like, I mean, I get it's college, you know, you might be cut out of social activities. Like, there is, there are sort of f tangible consequences, which is lame, but I think a good, honest convo with this alpha female, dude, you sit down, dude, you're sipping on some jungle juice, dude, you're going, hey, bro, look, I like you, I don't know what her name is, dude, Brittany, dude, look, Brittany, dude, you're chill, I get it, um, we had a good time, it's a sick hookup, it's college, you know what I mean? Like, um, I don't know if you want to date me, but I'm kind of into what's her name, and I think we might hit it off. Um, and you could even tell her, like, she, you know, be like, she hasn't told me this, but I think she's a little intimidated by you. Maybe she thinks that that you and I still have a thing going on, which we don't, right? We don't. And then she'll tell you, no, we don't. Okay, cool. 
yeah, we're friends. Okay, we'll be friends. All the best, dude. By the way, I think my buddy Ryan's into you who, you know, plays hockey, dude. Oh, hockey Ryan's into you? Yeah, hockey Ryan's into you. And guess what? He's got a friggin' fat hog, dude. So that's sick. And, you know, maybe she'll be stoked on that, dude. And then you just go, look, just take it easy, dude. Enjoy you. You know what I mean? And I don't know, maybe an alpha can't deal with that. And if she can't, then that's on her, dude. You guys just got to do you. What do you think, Aaron? Yeah, I think, uh, you, just, uh, you know, you, you do a, uh, a 10 things I hate about you or taming of the shrew. You got to, you got to get someone else to hook up with this alpha female. Yeah. So exactly, that her tractor exactly. beam is off of you. Hockey Ryan. Exactly. You need hockey Ryan to step up, dude. Yeah. And then you need to tell this girl, convince her that you're serious about her. That's, that's the easy part, dude. Just treat her nice. Tell her that you, how you feel. You're like, look, I like hanging out with you. I want to keep hanging out with you. And I want to. I'm, and you tell a nice phrase is you don't say, Ooh, let's just be exclusive. Like, don't make that choice for her. But say, Hey, so, you know, I'm not hooking up with anyone else right now. <laughs> just so you know, there you go, dude. There you go. Um, all right, here we go. Let's see. Hold on. This one's a little bit too long for right now, but I'm going to freaking roommate sitch, dude. My boy, Zach, dude. roommate sitch. I'm going to, I'm going to keep that one for another one. Um, let's see here, dude. Let's do a topic, dude. This is always sick. I haven't gotten a topic suggestion in a minute. What up, Strider? I'm messaging you on the topic of burning of the Gasby in Rhode Island. I'm a native Rhode Islander, a stalker, and a history dankist, dude. Let's go. The burning of the Gasby is what is recognized as the first action that I was think took. You mean Stoker, right? <laughs> You know what, dude? <laughs> That's so funny in it, but it's spelled S T O C K E R. You're right, dude. Stoker, dude. Yeah, probably. He's a Stoker and a history dankist. Yeah. Danktorian, yeah. Stoker and Danktorian. I thought he's like, why would someone just come out and say they're a stalker? You know, I, I was thinking like groceries because it's not S T A L K E R, like stalker. S T O C K E R. Stalker, dude. And I was like, all right, maybe he stalks at Vons or some shit. That's sick. Yeah, dude, that's hilarious, bro. All right, dude. Stoker, what up, dude? Um, the burning of the Gasby is what is recognized as the first action that was took, taken toward the Revolutionary War, and our little state celebrated every year on the proud fact that we started screwing the British. I would love to listen to your cover of this absolutely dank topic. Dank, what's more of the burning of the British? Okay. Um, so basically he's saying this, equating it to like being in the Boston Tea Party kind of, but up in Rhode Island. So maybe it's a fucking Rhode Island Tea Party, dude. All right, sick, dude. I like that, dude. Let's do it. I like that. All right, let's do one more than bone out, dude. This, my, this dude, freaking um, Spencer Laponda, dude. He's gonna go, dude. What up, bro? Strider. I want to wear my sick ass socks and sandals at the thanks. Or, excuse me, at the uh, Christmas Eve. This is from a Thanksgiving, but I'm gonna update it to Christmas Eve to make it more uh, representable for our viewers. The Christmas Eve dinner celebration, dude. Everyone wants to dress up nice, but I want to just post up in my socks and sandals, dude. What do I do? Don't. Yeah, I think it's an occasion, bro. Aaron's right. You can't. You can do that. Guess what? <clears throat> you can do that 364 other days of the year, bro. Yeah. And then also you can wear them after dinner. There is that, yeah. Like, I don't know if you guys are going out or with a deal. I mean, if it's at your house, I can maybe see that, dude. If your mom's like, no, put on shoes. But he's like, you're at home. I mean, you have a good point, dude. But honestly, you're splitting hairs at that point, dude. Don't be, honestly, don't say this right now, dude. Spencer, LaPonda, dude, don't be a bitch, dude. Just man up, dude. Make your mom happy. Get that, let that be her gift, dude. You know what I'm saying, dude? The gift of listening is a great gift. You know? It's a gift. To, it's a great gift to possess and a great gift to give. So I'm fired up on that, dude. And I want to freaking thank all you Dankatorians for listening, dude. Hopefully you guys had a freaking dank-ass holiday. Hopefully you're treating yourself right, dude. Hopefully you're freaking doing it all night, dude. And hopefully you're going to watch The Last Samurai again because you know I am. And Aaron had a legit-ass 4x4 from in and out and he enjoyed it. I'm going to tell you, he enjoyed it, but he didn't touch the fries. No, still trash. Didn't touch the fries. Sad to see that. Didn't even touch them. Dude. They were well done. All right, dudes, that's it. Freaking catch you on the next one. Question, comment, suggestion, stratawilsontrez at gmail.com. Please re leave a review because that's always legit too, dude. Helps the pod, dude. Appreciate you guys helping the pod. Let's freaking grow together and be beasts, dude. All right, dude, let's